I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. I've been starting off each of these episodes this season with pop-up interviews that I did at an event this year. I had a microphone and a digital recorder at my booth, and people would walk up and I would ask them what they do, and I would record it. The pop-up interview that I play today actually took place just a few weeks ago, when Mary Joy and I had visited Browser's Bookstore on State Street. After going in and meeting the woman that worked there, we just had to come back and talk to her again, because she was just kind of awesome. I'm going to sit like this just so I can make sure I get this up close to you, so... Hopefully it's not weird that I'm sitting on a little pedestal in front no. of you. <laughs> no, that's okay. I've um, never had men break before. <laughs> I'm Grace Reut, and I work at Browser's Bookstore. And how long have you been here? Too long to remember. <laughs> that's, that's a good amount of time. So the reason uh, we stopped in was because we were here about a month ago. You were here teaching someone to read, and he ran out to run an errand or something, and you told us about how you had met. His name is Batola. Okay. He came in one day and he said, I'm looking for books. I'm from, and he told me the name of the country, and I couldn't understand it. So he was talking in Turkish, uh-huh. and I said, spell it. And he said, T-U-R-K-E-Y. And I said, <laughs> Turkey? <laughs> you didn't say that in English, you know? <laughs> I was so embarrassed. But he was upset, and he left. But then he came back again, and he kept coming back every day. Mm -hmm. That I was here, and he came back with other people. And he came to get his doctorate in food science at the university. And the university told him, you have to learn English first. Oh. So he came to buy a book, and he sat with his phone to look up words he didn't know and read this book. So he was looking it up on his phone, like, was it like every other word, or how, did you notice yes. that he was doing this? Yes. Okay. And he introduced me to his wife on the phone and his child, because he'd call him a half a dozen times a day, because his child was two. Oh. And it was 10 o'clock at night, and it was morning here, and the kid wouldn't go to bed. <laughs> and he's <laughs> talking to his son, and it's really cute. What made you decide to help him learn how to read? He didn't ask for help. He just wanted to do it on his own. And we were just helping him Uh by speaking. And he was looking up the words he didn't understand. That's the conversation was he was trying to understand. And if he didn't understand, he wanted to look it up so it made sense. Yeah. So, you know, he'd come in and he'd, if I, if I picked up a broom, he'd clean for me. Oh. If. You know, anything I do that I needed done, he would do it for me. Would he come in here every day? When he wasn't in school. Oh, wow. he started school. And how long did this go on for? Probably a month. Okay. It didn't seem like it was only two months, maybe three. Okay. Because we thought he was going to be here for like six months to a year. Uh Uh-huh. But he told me the week before, I'm going on a trip with my co-worker. Mm -hmm. He asked me if I wanted to go to Kansas City to a conference with him. So he was gone for a whole week, didn't see him, and he came back, and he left the country. I was on vacation, so I didn't know what was happening. And then he came in and left a message. He was leaving the country go to go home, uh-huh. and that's all we knew. So that was the last I didn't see him because I had been gone. And up until then, you were saying that you had even been to his house to have dinners? And- he invited my roommates he had been he came home with me to my house for dinner yeah and then he took my friend and I out to dinner and then he went with us to see the Indians dance mm-hmm. at MATC and then we went and had coffee and dance at a coffee shop that had a band one night mm-hmm. and you know things that you wouldn't expect him to do he went and danced with my friend <laughs> <laughs> you know he mm-hmm. was so open minded he would try anything. Yeah. And since he was Muslim, it's really strange that his neighbors asked him to go to church, and he went to an American church with them. Really? Yes. Huh. How old do you think he was? I'm guessing he was probably 30, 35, yeah. because he'd already got, uh, he, he was working on his doctorate, but he already had been to school, had a job. Mm-hmm. You know, I found his email on the computer oh and I thought I didn't have it 
So now I have it. Oh, right. So now you yeah. can at least contact him, even yes. though he had to leave right. so abruptly. I don't know if that'll happen, if right. there'll be open communication anymore. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I hope you'll be able to get a hold of him, because right. it, was, it was interesting, the relationship yes. you guys had. It was my favorite part about when we were in here, and we kind of figured out what was going on that you were teaching him to read is you were having him actually look up the words on in Webster's Dictionary. So you were to the point of going, you don't know that word, look it up instead of on your phone. And he would read the definition. And at one point you're like, that's not right. <laughs> you, were like, you were questioning Webster's Dictionary. Yeah. And I loved that. That was, that was when we were like, well, we got to ask what's going on here. <laughs> you figured it out. The person that I meet today... I read about in the Isthmus publication. Luke Baziner, and I teach art at Crestwood Elementary School. The article about him talked about how he was creating a stop motion film with the students that he teaches in his art class at Crestwood Elementary School. And the film that they made was going to be screened at this year's Wisconsin Film Festival. After reading the article, I kind of had to talk to him. I mean, how could I not? And plus, he's also a musician. We decided to meet at the Mini Makers Fair at the Monona Terrace. It's a family-friendly event of inventions and kids that do creative things, and he was going to be doing a presentation there. This project started from a whole bunch of different things. Like we, mythology is built into the fourth grade literacy curriculum. So for a couple years, I was working with some of the teachers and doing like a graphic novel project based on mythology. And then I also collaborate with the music teacher, Sean McMahon, who's across the hall, and she was doing a project um, where the kids were composing music for Gustav Holst, the planets, like composing extra pieces. So that year we did some animation to go with it and make like a, a collaborative video music composition thing just called the planets. So you did one beforehand is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So that was the first, that was the first, we had this graphic novel project and this like animation music composition project. And as I was putting together all the animation for that, like this, splicing it in in order to put it over the top of the music I realized like if I had the kids plan out stuff that could be put sequentially we could do a narrative film uh, and then I was like well we already do this this graphic novel thing we could we could use the graphic novel as kind of like introduction to storyboarding and you know thinking sequentially and so we took that and took the the animation and the and they they were composing music that year as well so we used that as like the score put the two things together i didn't really know if it was going to work if it was going to make any sense but like i thought the process would be interesting and worth doing anyway so we just we did it and that movie was called daedalus and icarus and uh we we got into the wisconsin film festival and won a won a golden badger award what are they not going to give you the award <laughs> I, I don't i don't know so we, that was cool and so then the next year uh, it evolved a little bit and we wanted to kind of like, I, I have a feeling like kids a lot of times think of when they think of mythology, they think of Greek mythology because that's like what, what gets introduced most of the time. So we were going to do a myth from somewhere else in the world. So then we chose an Egyptian myth and we animated the myth of Isis and Osiris last year. And then the film festival thing has just kept rolling and we got into a few more film festivals this, this year. And then while that's been happening, our current fourth graders have been working on a Norse myth that we're going to launch uh, or that, that will be finished by like June because school ends in June. <laughs> we have to finish by then. Uh, and that's called the Valkyrie's Tale. You said you started out with the graphic novel thing. The first thing I thought of in my head is like, how do you get a group of kids to work on one graphic novel, but you do animation? And it's like, well, that's a huge collaborative effort. How were you managing that? So the, the graphic novel was was like, it was, it was more like each individual kid did basically like retold a story in two pages. Like they did their own. It was between two and like ambitious kids might go like eight pages or something. But like basically two page graphic novels. And then I would take all of them when they were done. And we would have like the school district's printing service like bind a book. And then they would get a copy of all the, all the different little graphic novels that their classmates made. I didn't even think about the binding thing. That's a great resource. <laughs> I didn't, I'm not sure that I knew the district had 
printing service, but that's a good thing to have older teachers around to let you know about these things. <laughs> to go, hey, you remember paper? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is your background as far as, I mean, because you can't just jump right in and go, hey, let's animate. Or maybe you can. Like, did you, do you have a background in that? My, my background in animation was taking my parents' camcorder when I was a kid, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't shoot for less than a second. Like, you couldn't take a frame at a time. So I would shoot, like, one second clips of things like do animation that way and then dub it from the camcorder to a VCR in fast forward so it would have like these lines across it but it would move fairly naturally that's my like there's my animation background but and then like I went to college as like a studio art major like drawing and painting and printmaking and stuff and I also wanted to do film but like in college like you have to kind of choose a thing so film kind of fell away for a while and then it just it magically bubbled back up in the last couple of years. It's good. I also saw a picture of you holding on to what seemed like a uh, block print, maybe? And is that how you guys did the characters that were in it? Yeah, yeah. When I was first kind of brainstorming how we could make this consistent across like 60 kids working on the same movie, I was trying to think of like, how can we make sure the same character looks the same in the beginning of the movie as in the end? And I already do lots of block printing projects with fourth and fifth graders. So I was like, okay, we're gonna, this year we're gonna do our block printing project and that's gonna be our character design project. And so then the, other, the next challenge was all the, you know, the characters turn around and do different things in the movie. Uh, and a block print is kind of just a static image. So we had to have, a group of kids kind of work together to agree on what the character, like common traits that the character would have, whether they were turned to the right or turned to the left or whatever. So they had, there was like a, there's a whole like character design unit that goes into it. And then that turns into a block print, like lino cut, even though it's like rubber, it's not linoleum, but a block printing unit. What uh, software did you use to actually film it? The first two years we used a free app called iMotion that I, that I like. It has like a, onion skin effect so you can you can see the previous frames and you can see how far you're moving stuff. This current year we've switched to another free app called Stop Motion Studio. It has a few different features. Both of them are cool. They're both free. They both have like add-ons you can buy, but like we use the free version. Yeah. Um, and then the editing, like I, I put all the kids' pieces together in iMovie later. <laughs> This is what I love about meeting people that also do similar things or things that I want to know more about. So the picture for this event here, for your booth, it's an iPad balanced on the edge of a table and then the stuff's on the floor. And the first thing I thought of was like, holy crap, I never thought of filming it that way. That's so simple. There's no like setup and then you got to balance things like, how are you going to stand things up? No, you put them on the floor and then use the edge of the table. I love that. So how did you go, oh, we could just do it this way? Like what was the, the light bulb moment for that? Basically we're super high tech and I'm really cheap. Like I had seen some cool setups, the, the bubbler, the, the public library has a great, they, like they have these great stands that have arms that hold the iPad in. But then when, when we were thinking about doing it with paper, it just made sense to have it lying flat anyway. So we kind of figured out how big the background would have to be to kind of fill the frame of the, the iPad camera. And then it was like, oh, a table. If we, hang, if we hang it off the table, we need it to be about this big. Okay, there's our scale. And we worked, we worked that way. And it's funny because in traditional 2D animation, that's how they do it. You just don't think of it that way. When you think of stop motion, you're like, oh, you have to stand everything up and walk it around the room. So I just wanted to know more about that. And literally that was like, it opened a spot in my mind where I'm like, oh, I know how I could do this now. We did a separate thing this year. The Wisconsin Film Festival asked our fifth graders to do a trailer for their Big Screens Little Folks program, like the, the kids programming. And I didn't want to do exactly the same thing we had done last year because that, like, I don't know, I don't want to do the same project all the time. So we were trying to, we brainstormed like ways to do three-dimensional stop motion animation. And so we wound up doing these like cardboard cutout characters that can move around. But for that one, our very high-tech solution to not having a stand was we took a, a plastic cup and set it upside down and cut a slit in it and stuck the iPad in that. And that was how we stood up our iPads. Would you say that there were any influences in the animation that you create? When you did it, do you have things in mind or styles that you're kind of 
th that have influenced you over the years? Visually for this, like I, I wanted to keep it really simple. I wanted the colors to be consistent. So they're very like, the backgrounds are always monochrome and that's partially because we're working with block prints that are black and white. I guess like German expressionism would be an influence visually on how it looks. And that's partially just in the accidental way that block prints turn out, but also I like that stark kind of imagery. And we've been pretty like consistent about picking, picking a monochrome color scheme for each film. So the first one was Greek myth and we just made it black and white. So the, all the backgrounds are construction paper and various shades of gray. The second one was an Egyptian myth, so it, like, I asked the kids, what do you think it would be? And they're like, it's probably in the desert, so it should be browns. This year is a Norse myth, and we were talking about how, like, that's a cold environment, so they chose blues as the, as the background. How did the actual finished characters get decided? Kind of by consensus. Like, the kids could choose what character they wanted to work on, and then based on the story that they had read, they had to think of what would that character look like so if it's like a you know the character is a warrior what's he going to look like but if there's three different warrior characters in the story how are you going to distinguish them from one another like each one of them has to have some kind of distinguishing characteristics so we talk about a we talk a little bit about how they do that in movies and comic books and stuff like that to make sure that you know who a character is as soon as they come on the screen. Yeah, how long does it take to work with 60 kids and make a short film? I see each kid one hour a week. It's only one hour a week. Oh, I thought it was like one hour a day. Oh, wow. One, one hour a week, so art class is one hour a week, and I have every, every kid in the school. We have four sections of fourth grade, so I have three fourth grade classes each week. It takes about a semester from beginning to end, maybe even longer, honestly, because there's a unit where we're just basically doing the graphic novel thing, reading through the story, and they're kind of drawing along as we go. Then there's the character design thing, which turns into a printmaking lesson. Then there's like a big landscape, kind of really, really loose perspective lesson that goes for making the backdrops. Then there's actual storyboarding lesson. Then there's like the actual animation that's probably four or five weeks. You guys film the storyboards or do you just post them up? Just just draw them. We don't we don't film them. It moves really fast. We're really only doing a couple weeks on each of these things and then by the time you add it up it's it's taken a long time. But so there's a whole bunch of little kind of more measurable chunks to the project. Just from a school angle I have to think of it that way. <laughs> kids that move on I mean are, they, are you gonna have them get involved as they get older if they want to be like like what are really the future plans of this uh, I would love to have them stay involved I mean the future plans are we want to be the Joseph Campbell of fourth grade yes. and like explore myths from all over the world and tap into like the importance of mythology and legend and culture and all that kind of stuff that's my like giant <laughs> educational goal uh, but in terms of like keeping kids involved like a, a former student just posted a comment on the trailer of the trailer for the new movie on our youtube channel this morning so that's cool i i do like run into kids every once in a while so hopefully this this continues and and like kids do something beyond this little project that i have them do when i was going to high school they only offered animation one semester and it was with a substitute teacher and to this day I don't think I would have known how to do animation if it wouldn't have been for that brief period of time that he taught us. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So hopefully that will have the same influence regardless of where it goes. I think that it's gonna clearly come across to the students that participated in it. Regardless of the fact that it's not an elective class, I don't think. <laughs> Elementary school, everybody's got to take art. <laughs> I love that. Whether they like it or not. Are there any other plans for the movie after all of these showings that it's done? I mean, do you guys plan to do more with it? Yeah, definitely. So this, this past year is the first time I started really like submitting to more film festivals around the country. Isis and Osiris, the one we did last year, was in the Palm Springs International Animation Festival and the Wyoiga International Film Festival, the Green Bay Film Festival, and the Wisconsin Film Festival. And it's, it's submitted to a few more, so we'll see if we get any more and then I'll do that whole process again with A Valkyrie's Tale and we'll see if we get in some. So the festivals have been really cool. Wisconsin Film Festival has been great because they've helped us 
coordinate like setting up these kind of animation workshops outside of outside of school that's put me in touch with people from the bubbler at Madison Public Library and people from Wisconsin Public Television and whatever so I mean I'm always looking for more ways to make this more of like a public outreach kind of thing how do you submit it to stuff? I mean, do you just look them up? You have to get a hold of them so far ahead of time. And it's like, well, I didn't even hear about you until after I heard it was happening. So how do you find these people? A lot of the festivals are on this website called Film Freeway. Wisconsin Film Festival had just recently gone to Film Freeway. So I did that one to submit this last thing. So I can just browse festivals and look. Is if there's some like regional connection that would make us worth putting in there? Or is there like a youth connection or some kind of component that would make this movie more logical, make it more worth entering. That's actually a really good tip. Musically, you also kind of do loops from what I've seen. How did you start making music? Then? When I'm not being an art teacher, my, my secret super alter ego is that I play music. <laughs> One of the projects I play in is called Asumaya. It's just like my solo project and it's a looping pedal. And it kind of came about because I had a band that, that sort of div dissolved. I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana, and you know, while I was gone, like the, you know, the band kind of faded away because I was gone for two years. And we got back together later, but eventually, like while I was there, I was thinking about the idea of different rhythms over repeating patterns because I would hear like the, the sounds of funeral drumming in the distance, and like you kind of start putting melodies in your head as as you, as you listen to this and you can do so many different things over the top of the same the same rhythm or the same like ostinato yeah. and so when i when i got back eventually I, I kept thinking about that idea and so i bought a looping pedal to see if i could you know make that happen and so now i now i play a whole bunch of instruments through a looping pedal and a lot of times it's it's like you know, something is staying the same all the time, but I'm trying to figure out how many different patterns or time signatures or whatever I can play over the top of the same thing and try and keep it interesting for the length of a song. There's just so much room for error. Like recently I tried doing stuff with just a looping program and even that it's like you miss one little thing. It's like, boom, everything falls apart. I mean, the songs that I write, I get really like specific about where stuff comes in and how much I do it just because I want it to be interesting like I don't I don't want it to like drag on forever because you could get really lazy with it but I also at the same time like I so I write these really like kind of precise planned out songs and then I try and make sure I do like at least one or two improvised pieces each set just to like make sure I'm not getting lazy that way cool I like it and I'm a little jealous of how you're able to do it you know I love that Luke just makes it work with what he has available and builds on it from there I know a lot of people do that, it's just nice to know that you're not the only one sometimes. If you haven't already, to subscribe to this show, you can go to AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe and choose an option for iPhone, Android, YouTube, and even get the show sent to you by email. The music on the show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music, and you can find more in the music section at the AmericanBandito.com website. And don't forget to show your support for the show and get one of our stickers while you're on the site, huh? All right, next time on the show, I get the chance to talk to a tattoo artist. Until then, so long. Mm -hmm.